Hi, and welcome to this exclusive training video brought to you by Category Management Knowledge Group. We've created this video for you because you're obviously interested in furthering your category management understanding from a sales perspective and have enjoyed some of the other materials that CMKG provides. In this video, I'm going to walk you through five things I wish I had known in my first five years in sales as it relates to category management. This video will provide you with some snippets of different training that we have available in our many certified training courses and hopefully will get you some new ideas and get you excited about investing in yourself and possibly purchasing some of CMKG's training in the future. In case you don't know about Category Management Knowledge Group, let me tell you a few things first. I'm Sue Nichols, the president and founder of CMKG. I spent 20 years in P&G in sales, then in category management, ultimately managing the Canadian category management team and serving on global Catman committees. Michelle Patterson is the Director of Training and Development and also started her career with 12 years at P&G, both in category management as well as sales, trade marketing, and 10 years as a corporate trainer. The biggest distinction between CMKG and our e-learning competition is that we're category management professionals first and an e-learning company second. We have a huge passion in what we do and feel privileged to work with so many category management professionals, sales professionals, consumer packaged goods companies, and retail companies. We offer accredited courses and programs that all relate to category management for individuals, teams, and organizations, with many options and the flexibility to create custom blended learning solutions. Our training is applicable to different functions, including sales, marketing, and different experience levels as well in both North America and globally. So let's get started on the official part of this training. Here's the five tips that we're gonna be reviewing. Number five is know your data. Number four, share category management. Number three, know how to sell and present. Number two, know your retailer strategies. And number one, understand inventory. There's many other tips, but these are the five that we're going to stick to in this video. So let's get started. So number five is to know your data. We're inundated with new and different data sources, and in order to use it or even sell with it, you have to understand it. You can't rely on your category management analyst to do all of the analysis for you and then have you present those numbers and feel comfortable with them. You really need to understand your data. For example, how is it sourced? What are the strengths and weaknesses of it? And how and when should it be used? Look at all of these data sources. What do they have in common? We've got scanned sales data, retail measurement data, consumer panel data, and shopper loyalty data. Each of them are collected and measured very differently, but they have one thing in common. Can you think of it? They're all reliant on how much the consumer purchases. Ultimately, it's the consumers that drive the data, whether it's scanned sales data, market data, or consumer panel data. At the end of the day, what ends up in the shopping baskets is what generates the sales for both retailers and suppliers. It's not a difficult concept to understand, but it really does help to explain the importance of focusing on the consumer and shopper, even when using data in category management. Each data source has its own watchouts and strengths, which are important to understand. Let's review a few examples. Retail point of sale data is the queen of category management data with powerful, flexible analysis. But it doesn't have comparative markets or channels, and retailers need to segment the data ongoing and maintain that segmentation ongoing, which many retailers struggle with. For salespeople, when there's weekly sales data in there, you should be all over that doing promotional and pricing analysis to really understand the effectiveness of the promotions that you run. Retail measurement data is also very powerful data with in-depth volumetric and causal analysis and comparative markets and channels for retailers and suppliers to benchmark against. But it's sometimes only a sample of stores projected to a total chain, and sometimes market doesn't cover a large percentage of the total market, particularly in some categories. Also, the data can be very expensive. Once again, there's so much information that salespeople can pull out of retail measurement data that relates to and is very important to for their retailer to understand. Consumer panel data is a great source to get consumer and shopper information from. 
How well do you understand your retailer shoppers? It includes consumer demographics, consumer purchase behavior, and market research can also be conducted using this data source. You need to ensure that the data is significant based on the number of raw buyers. You should focus on trends in the data and compare numbers to draw conclusions. This one's a little bit more complex, but it's a super powerful data source for salespeople to be using to really understand the implications of how they changed the category tactics and the impact that that had on the overall consumer. I've also included shipment and warehouse data. This is the data that suppliers ship to retailers' warehouses and the warehouses send to the stores. It's the last resort data source for situations where you need to create a total market, but you don't have any other data. You need to keep in mind when using shipment data that cases sold does not equal consumption because the cases can still be sitting in a warehouse. Dollar sales are hard to quantify from cases sold because the cost can vary based on the customer ship to point. And if you're shipping product to one warehouse where it's then shipped to multiple banners, you can't see the allocation across banners. There's so much more detail that you should know about your data sources than this including how each of the data sources is gathered. So know your data, not just how it's collected, but the strengths and the weaknesses of the data, and also think about how it's accessed. Is there limited access to the data within your organization? Is it hard to find? Or is it easily accessible and consistently available to the sales organization? How difficult is the data mining tool to use? How confident are you with the data that it's correctly pulled out of the tool? And how much usage is there of each of the data sources? Are you even using it? Or are you relying on your category management team to do that work for you? Sometimes how you answer these questions can also correlate with how accurately the data is used for you, your team, and your organization. Obviously, there's nothing worse than a salesperson presenting the wrong data to their retailer. It loses credibility, and even worse, it can lead to wrong decisions being made if the errors aren't caught. So knowing your data and double checking it is a core requirement whenever data is being used. This can lead to data hole pickers, and I find there's a lot of them in sales. That's for a lack of a better term. These people who find the weaknesses in data sources and have everyone so scared to use the data that they don't, especially if they've lost credibility once. And what does that leave them with? Nothing. So if you want to move to a more strategic sales platform and fact-based approach with your retailers, you need to understand the watchouts of the data sources, ensure that you're receiving good access to the data, and that you start training yourself on understanding the data sources and how they can be maximized. As next steps on knowing your data, first of all, get trained. CMKG offers three different courses that relate to data, including our highly popular Understanding and Using Data, and then two that focus specifically on consumer panel data and retailer POS data. You can also bridge any knowledge gaps that you may have in your data understanding by working with your third-party data supplier or through peers in your organization. And lastly, you should identify gaps that you may have in your data and what you're expected to do with it, and even how accessible the data is to you and your sales team. For example, you can't do promotional effectiveness analysis very well with monthly data, and you can't do an in-depth consumer analysis without consumer panel data. Tip number four is to share and train in category management knowledge and strategies across functions within your organization and with your customers. Don't let the category management team stay up in that ivory tower, sharing little or no information out of their department. This was a practice that was common in the 1980s, but it really limits the whole organization. You need to train your sales and marketing teams on category management in order to move the bar forward for your entire organization. Within some supplier organizations, there's a belief that sales and marketing should not be engaged in or really understand much about category management. Category management resources are the only ones who do category management work in this scenario. They're the data pullers, the PowerPoint makers, and the ones who can talk about and explain data. Sales should be selling, and marketing should be marketing in this environment. But I'm really here to dispel that myth. These suppliers may also follow a very traditional sales approach. First, you have the brand and research and development folks developing new products in their secret laboratories. 
Next, the marketing department is responsible for doing consumer testing, determining the target consumer and how to reach them. And then the new products are passed on to sales. Sales is responsible for spinning a pitch for the new product. And then the new products are presented to the retailer. Suppliers are typically focused first on brand and then on category. The addition of the category analysis and planogramming team by suppliers is an added value to the retailer and a standard practice in consumer packaged goods. A fact-based approach behind category opportunities from a supplier perspective can make a big difference in the results, particularly if the supplier positions the opportunity from a category opportunity, not just a brand-driven opportunity. But having the category management work completed at the end of the process means that the category management team is sometimes stuck trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. Marketing creates the new product launch plans, including distribution targets, in the absence of the category management team. Sales and the category management team will receive the initiative at the same time, with sales being responsible for presenting the new product launch, including the backup data that was supplied by the category management analyst, to meet the distribution targets, and the category management analyst being responsible for making the new initiatives fit at their retailer, in their assortment and on their shelving, based on marketing's distribution targets that from a category management perspective are often impossible to attain. This can include forcing new items into planograms that really don't belong. I'm intentionally being somewhat negative here to get my point across, which is that at no time in this process does the retailer strategy even come into play? It's all about getting the distribution targets achieved in as many stores as possible, even if it's not the right product for the right retailer. Retailers will have different strategies across all of the tactics. Let's review some of the ones when it comes to product assortment. Some may be trying to carry the widest assortment available, or conversely, they may want to carry a limited number of items, particularly in formats like hard discount. They may have market coverage objectives to measure what percentage of the total market sales their items represent. Others may have strategies that focus on private label, where they don't want to carry too much selection in items or brands that compete directly with their own private label items, or focus on large or club pack sizes. Some retailers may focus on a premium assortment lineup that targets a high income consumer, while others may focus on less expensive items targeted to low income consumers. Another strategy may be to be the first to market on new product launches to increase excitement in the stores. Suppliers need to understand each retailer's unique strategies to make recommendations that consider and align with their overall assortment strategies. A one-size-fits-all approach is not going to work. So back to our model. Suppliers present products that aren't aligned to retailer strategies, and yes, some retailers will make listing decisions based purely on negotiating their listing fees. Once again, leaving out that target consumer and shopper who has unique needs at each retailer that they shop at. And leaving retailers making decisions that may go against their overall assortment principles that doesn't focus on the shoppers. Ultimately, it's not going to work. The opportunity is to integrate a category management approach into all aspects of the supplier organization, from product development to marketing to sales. A category approach is considered. Data is purchased proactively up to 18 months before a new product launch happens. There's a set of cascading reports that fall through the company that everybody's looking at the data the same way. This gives suppliers insights into how the new products might fit into the category for each retailer based on their overall assortment strategies, and the data and learnings are then integrated into the sales presentations. Sales no longer has to rely on relationship selling only and lots of money to get the new products listed. A fact-based, value-add approach can be invaluable to the retailer. This creates a tailored approach for retailers based on their strategies. Suppliers who are able to adopt this approach become much more strategic with their new product launches through strong category management and consumer understanding. Also, suppliers need to ensure that they're communicating with all functions at the retailer who are involved in the category through a multifunctional team. So share category management. Train sales and marketing on the category management foundations. 
CMKG has many courses that many of our clients purchase for their entire organization, including sales and marketing, to give them a solid category management from foundation from which they can make more fact-based and aligned decisions. Think about having an internal category management team that creates a bridge between sales and marketing and or have some resources sitting on the new product launch teams from the inception. And move your whole organization forward in category management, moving everyone to a more strategic level. The third tip is to know how to sell and present for, with a fact-based approach. If you're responsible for making internal or external presentations, you should know and understand the selling process. It helps to give flow to your presentations when you're selling any kind of idea and trying to get buy-in regardless of who you're presenting to. A simple flow can be applied to many different types of sales presentations. I'm going to quickly walk you through the steps for a good flow. The first step is a summary of the situation, which could, should consider the customer's current conditions, needs, limitations, and opportunities, which then need to tie in with the overall purpose of the presentation. It becomes retailer-centric. In this case, the customer is the retailer, and a good summary of the situation requires a strong understanding of the retailer's overall strategy. We're going to get into that as one of our other tips, including their short and long-term objectives and focus areas in their business. A good summary in this situation would be to tie in relevant data through some type of category review. Then it becomes fact-based and focused on the customer. Step two is to state the idea, and the purpose of this step is to tell your audience what action you're recommending. This is best communicated in one or two sentences. The idea should be obvious to the audience before you state it if you did a strong job in summarizing the situation. Step three is explaining how the idea will work, which comprises the main body of the presentation. In this step, you need to connect directly to your purpose and bridge it using relevant points and information. Cover enough points to achieve your purpose and objectives, no more, and be sure to support your points clearly and concisely. And don't think you need to include all of the data that In the fourth step, you should briefly summarize how the idea meets the needs and opportunities that were presented in the summary of the situation. This is also where you explain the specific benefits of your idea where appropriate. This summary should capture the three or four key points of the presentation. The final step is to suggest easy next steps based on specific actions that may tie in with the objectives of the presentation. This is the ultimate purpose of the presentation, yet is the most often missed step in the process. Whether it's a sales call or an internal pitch, getting the alignment or confirmation is the ultimate goal. So ask for specific actions and you'll make it easy for the action to begin. Hopefully you can see from this simple process that it can be applied to many different types of presentations, not just a traditional sales presentation. It really does work. If you need help on selling in a more fact-based approach, once again, there's many options to you. There's some great books available on selling and also some great online resources. You may have internal courses on how to sell, but are they fact-based approach? CMKG has several courses that relate to selling and presenting, including a fact-based selling course, a strategic selling course, and a collaborative selling course. We even have one on PowerPoint. I always talk to my supplier clients about being retailer-centric and to my retailer clients about being able to articulate their overall strategies both internally and externally. Retailer strategies embedded in many of the tips I've already presented, but this one is really critical for you to understand in order to be successful in category management as a salesperson. So why is it so important to understand retailer strategy? Think of it as an umbrella. It drives all of the different components of the category management process at the retailer, as well as the overall category plan. The retailer strategy ensures that all of the retailer's departments are working towards a united and consistent strategy. It kind of creates the guidelines and principles for the whole organization. Here's the definition of category management and how it integrates with retailer strategy. Different plans are created for each category that are based on the retailer's overall strategies that include retail format, target consumer, the competitive environment, and the retailer's private label and no name, or sometimes called control label, brands. So the retailer needs to make decisions across these four buckets to develop their overall retailer strategy. 
I could spend a day just talking about retailer strategy. But here's some of the questions that you can ask in order to understand and properly articulate a retailer's overall strategy. If you're a salesperson calling on a key account, but you can't answer these questions for this specific retailer that you call on, category management and ultimately collaborative selling are going to be much more difficult. Some retailers may not have well-articulated strategies, others may have strategies but they don't share them with suppliers, and others will work very closely with their supplier partners to articulate their overall strategies and then they expect suppliers to come to them with plans that will help them to achieve their objectives. Think about how well you can articulate your retailer's overall strategies based on these questions. Here are some suggestions to learn more about your retailer strategies. Review the questions that I shared with you on the previous page and determine how well you can articulate your retailer strategies. CMKG has several courses that relate to retailer strategy. In fact, Almost all of our courses do. Like I mentioned before, we tend to be retailer centric, which also ties in with a focus on the shopper. Start asking questions to your retailer, read more publications, and learn through all of the online news and great white papers that are available out there. The final tip relates to understanding inventory. You may think that what does category management have to do with inventory? But when you think about it, changes that are made to each of the category tactics can have a direct impact on a retailer's inventory. So from a category management perspective, it's really important to consider that. Let's go through a few calculations you need to understand. There's a cost of goods calculation, and there's an opportunity for retailers to lower their cost of goods sold. They can do this by lowering their beginning and ending inventory thereby reducing the cost of goods sold. In net, retailers want to carry the least amount of inventory possible while avoiding out of stocks. Turns is the number of times that a company's inventory cycles or turns over per year. Another way to think about it is the number of times a retailer sells their average investment in inventory each year. The calculation is the annual cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory level. Or in this example, $20 million cost of goods sold divided by $5 million in inventory equals four inventory turns per year. So the retailer turns their inventory or sells their average investment four times per year. Some retailers may calculate inventory based on sales instead of cost of goods sold. The inclusion of profit in the value of sales inflates the size of the numerator in that calculation. Days of inventory on hand tells the average amount of time a company will hold inventory before the inventory is sold. The calculation is the number of days in a year divided by inventory turns. Once again, inventory turns is the cost of goods sold divided by the average inventory. In this example, it's 365 days a year divided by $20,000 cost of goods sold divided by 2,500 to equal an inventory days on hand of 46. The interpretation is that this retailer carries 46 days worth of inventory. You can see the difference in inventory days on hand based on the difference in the number of inventory turns in these three examples. When we take these calculations back to the beginning and ending inventory, remember that the overall objective for the category manager is to reduce their overall inventories thus reducing the total cost of goods sold. Inventory turns and days on hand are two ways to measure that. As I already mentioned, inventory and product supply are important to retailers and therefore it should be important for sales teams to understand. If you don't understand those few basic calculations that I just showed you, you may want to consider taking some courses that relate to these areas. You should also have a better understanding of space management and planograms, not on the technical side of how to make them, but how to strategically understand them and the influence that they have on inventory. And where possible, build the impacts of inventory into your sales presentations so that they're more focused on the retailer and what they're trying to accomplish. So these are the five tips I walked you through in this exclusive video created just for people like you. I hope you learned a few things, got a few good ideas, and enjoyed the insights that I shared with you. All of the examples I shared with you come from our set of accredited courses. 
once again, all available online. Regardless of if you're looking for industry certification or specific sales programs, or if you just want to take a few great courses, our accreditation confirms that our training meets or exceeds industry standards. You have the choice of taking one course as a quick fix need for a project, select a group of courses to create a customized program specific for you, or you can take one of our many programs with many different options available. We've combined courses to create different course groupings based on role and what it is that you're trying to accomplish in your unique training program. Because you're a salesperson or you run a sales team, you'd probably be focused on the sales programs, although some of our clients choose to focus on the category management programs because they want to get their sales team certified. Completely up to you. Of note, we can also customize programs for corporate clients to include blended learning and customized elements in the program, including live training. If you're interested in learning more about CMKG sales courses and programs, here are some suggested next steps. Also, you'll receive an email from us after downloading this video that will give you more information if you want to take any action. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this video and I really encourage you to continue to venture down your path of continuous learning. Have a great day.